Thank you all so much for coming. I'm Deborah Luscombe. I'm on the uh, Collaborative Community staff. And um, Collaborative Community is the umbrella of Restoring the Soul in Focus. Restoring the Soul uh, makes these forums happen once a month. In addition to these forums, um, we have a newsletter. You can find that on the website. And I think you have one of these that has all the website addresses and a little more information about what we're up to. Um, basically, Restoring the Soul uh, facilitates service opportunities, uh, collaborating faith communities in service. I want to begin by thanking our host, Har Har Shem, for allowing us to use this beautiful room again and um, our co-sponsor, Boulder County Housing and Human Services. Also, I want to say just a word, a sh short word about this food. Almost all of it, 90% of it is local. Um, all of the produce, except for that 10% piece, was picked yesterday wow. from local organic farms. Hmm. The uh, Hummus is made here, and I was just delighted to discover that the chocolate is made here. Uh, I have pre-broken all the chocolate bars, but it's up to you to open the packages and pass them around to your neighbors. The water is also local water. Um, restrooms are right back here, little practicalities. Compost bins, all of the, um, except for these plastic spoons, all the bowls and plates and napkins and hot cups and cold cups are compostable, and there's three little white bins over there for the compost. Also on the table as you came in, there are handouts from our panelists uh, and also from Restoring the Soul, a little bit about food, local food. Uh, I, I put together a very short list of resources um, that you may have picked up, and really short, just a beginning for you to add to. Uh, please save your questions for the end, after all of our panelists have spoken. And you'll need to come up to this mic because um, we're being recorded for broadcast on KGNU. So I guess I should say hello to all those folks who are listening on the radio. And rumor has it that's five to 10,000 people. Um, also, in front of you, in addition to this sheet about the forum, there's an evaluation sheet. Please, we would just be delighted if you could fill it out, and I'll probably remind you again at the end. So, I don't know what brought you all here, if you're wondering what food justice is, or um, know exactly what it is and are passionate about it, but I'm going to just give you a brief overview. Um, decades ago, after the world, world War II, mostly, our industrial food system was born. And the, the logic was, I mean, the intention was to make more food available to more people at a lower cost. Little did we know that uh, manipulating the natural order of things with monocultures which is, you know, one crop on hundreds and hundreds of acres, uh, the use of chemicals, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, and huge machines would have such disastrous results environmentally to our soil and water and air and all the other species we share this planet with. Now we know. We know that all of the choices we make, all of the choices we make, the clothes we wear, our mode of transportation, every bite we put in our mouth have far-reaching environmental and social consequences. Planetary environmental and social consequences. 
And unfortunately, too often, the healthier option for us personally and for the planet is defined by economics. So how do we move away from an industrial food system that produces, as Michael Pollan says, edible food-like substances which degrade the environment during production and degrade our bodies during ingestion to a wholesome, organic, community-based food production system which enriches and nourishes people and the planet? And how do we ensure that everyone, everyone, has access to wholesome, nourishing food and community? This is the scope of food justice. Now we will hear from our panelists about what their organizations are doing to address some of these issues locally. First, since I've only just met these folks, we'll hear from Bill Stevenson, who's the director of the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Cooperative Development. Is that right, Bill? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Well, it's just a delight to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Stevenson. I'm director of the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Cooperative Development Center. Uh, we, our offices are in the Denver Tech Center. Uh, we, however, have uh, four cooperative developers uh, doing work uh, mostly in rural areas throughout Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico. You know, uh, I was looking at Tanya's outline for us as far as what we should be talking about, and I guess I'll get into mission and activities first for Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. I imagine many folks here haven't uh, had a chance to become familiar with this great organization. Uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union is a 501c5 organization, the umbrella organization at least is. Uh, that means it basically is a, a tax-exempt advocacy organization, in this case for an agricultural cause, in this specific case uh, for family farmers and ranchers uh, in the three states of Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming. Um, the C5 owns an insurance agency that's one of the uh, ten largest insurance agencies in Metro Denver. There's a beauty to that with respect to the funding of our, uh, of our work, and so I never forget to thank that insurance agency for all it does. Uh, also connected uh, to this web of organizations in the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union universe is the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Foundation, which is a 501c3. C uh, yes, donations are tax deductible. Um, RMFU, as I mentioned, uh, is the leading progressive advocacy organization for family farmers and ranchers and their communities in Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming. Uh, we have, the, org the organization itself is a membership-based organization, uh, roughly 22,000 families are members in the three-state area of Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. And it is a subdivision of the National Farmers Union, which carries the banner for family farmers and ranchers in a very progressive way nationally. It, uh, that organization is based in Washington, D.C., because so much of their work is legislative and policy-driven. Um, by far, uh, as you can sort of see from that introduction, uh, we come at the, uh, to the issue of food justice very humbly uh, from a uh, producers, from the producers, the family farmers and ranchers perspective, and I think you'll hear about that as I go on. Um, the foundation for which I work, for which the, uh, which the Co-op Development Center is part of, uh, also has an education center and a renewable energy center. So there are three real projects that are going on big time at the found, uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Foundation level. Um, the Cooperative Development Center's uh, mission is to um, develop cooperatives and other businesses particularly in rural areas and particularly uh, agriculture-related businesses. Um, Co-ops, as you may or may not know, it's a wonderful business model. Co-ops are, I'll, I'll give you three, a, a very broad overview, three main characteristics of cooperatives. They are user-owned. The users of the cooperative actually own the cooperative. 
They are user controlled, uh, small d democratically controlled, uh, one member, one vote generally. Uh, and this is, of course, by the users who own them. And then they are user benefiting. Uh, the benefits are derived and distributed to uh, the uh, members on the basis of use. So you can tell that noun, uh, user, and that verb use are, are very key attributes of cooperatives. And we'll get into a little bit more of what cooperatives look like in the uh, 10 minutes or so I have remaining. What does the uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Cooperative Development Center do? Well, our, the majority of our funding is from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. So that's why we are so rural focused, because uh, the definition of rural that we, have, that we deal with under the USDA mandate is communities of 50,000 people or less. Um, but that fits perfectly the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union mission. The, the, the organization itself is over 100 years old. And it was founded to advocate for family farmers and ranchers way back when, in the early 20th century. So the idea that we're rural focused uh, is, is great. Uh, that's, that, that fits with us perfectly as far as the USDA charge. Um, we are um, charged with developing cooperatives, as I mentioned. The USDA grant that we work under is called the Rural Cooperative Development Grant. So that sort of says it all, doesn't it? Uh, we also have quite a bit of funding from other sources. And with that funding, we also do some uh, urban ag work that we're real tickled with. And actually, we're uh, getting more and more into the urban ag sector. Uh, and it's a very dynamic sector. Mostly, we're focusing on projects in Denver. But uh, who knows where we may go with that. Um, the Cooperative Center itself does sort of seven th uh, things. I'll be very, um, uh, very general. We assist with grant proposals. Uh, we assist with uh, writing feasibility studies and business plans. Uh, we review uh, and prepare organizational documents for cooperatives. I myself uh, am I, I'm new to the cooperative world, relatively speaking, about 18 months. I was a corporate attorney in the farmers union world since 1983. I've, I worked in, uh, as a corporate attorney for 25 years and we also have another attorney on staff, a very, very well-versed cooperative attorney. So we bring a lot of, uh, I think, uh, pizzazz to uh, writing uh, uh, articles of incorporation and bylaws. Hopefully we do. Um, we explore financial options, uh, looking for capital for the projects that we adopt and incubate. Um, we uh, help conduct research surveys and assessments. Uh, we do organizational, tra organizational training and development, including um, board training, of course, and management staff training. And we also are, serve as the fiscal sponsor, actually, for several organizations that are not yet 501c3s, but are uh, primed to get grants. They're ready to, to get into that grant solicitation world, and we help with that. Um, as far as food justice is concerned, Deborah did a wonderful job of defining it. Um, uh, perhaps examples of where we stand are Rocky Mountain Farmers Union policy and what we do will help um, define, uh, for us anyway, this inspiring and challenging term. This is our Rocky Mountain Farmers Union 2012 policy. It, it, there's some substance here, as you can see. It is developed uh, every November uh, in a grassroots fashion, delegates from all over uh, small towns, small communities uh, generally, and, off, and we also have a Denver branch as well, gather at our annual convention and spend a day and a half developing policy, which is this, becomes this. And there'll be a new colored booklet that says 2013 uh, after this coming November. Um, the RMFU policy is based on supporting those initiatives that strengthen family farms and ranches, which uh, produce safe, healthy, domestically produced food for the U.S. Ro Rocky Mountain Farmers Union in general opposes corporate agriculture because it dehumanizes a fundamental social contract that a community of producers and consumers will share resources for the common good. Examples of our 2012 policy, and as you can see, these are very few examples, it's a big book, uh, include supporting the women's, infants, and children's program, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, for which in Colorado we are uh, serving as the uh, sponsor uh, this year, the School Lunch and Breakfast and Summer Programs, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistant, Assistance Program, formerly Food Stamps, 
Uh, the, uh, of course, farmers markets. We are the fiscal sponsor for the Colorado Farmers Market Association. We are big believers in the farmers market model as far as direct producer to consumer relationships. Um, and food education programs such as Slow Foods. We've got a very good relationship with Slow Foods. Um, we are in favor of adopting organic and sustainable farming practices that satisfy our food and fiber needs while enhancing the environment and making the most efficient use of resources. Another example is we are um, very much in support of incentives for family farmers and community-based organizations to invest in renewable energy. We are very much in support of fair, open, competitive markets with pricing transparency, something that the industrialized agricultural world that uh, Deborah mentioned in her introduction, um, oftentimes it makes very challenging, this, the whole notion of competitive, open, and transparent markets. And finally, we, National Farmers Union at the um, national level was probably the primary advocate for something called COOL, uh, which is country of origin label. We are labeling. We are very much in favor of that. And actually, we pr probably, not to sound immodest, but we're um, if not the, certainly one of the driving um, um, resources for bringing that about, for bringing COOL, although actually implementing COOL has been a, a, a challenge that I don't need to get into at this point. Examples of RMFU policy and action on food justice issues, I'm very proud to tell you about James Patton, uh, RMFU's most famous president who later became National Farmers Union's most famous president. He played a pivotal role in the creation of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization in the late 1940s. He was the architect of the UN's Food for Peace program and was president of the American Freedom from Hunger Foundation, part of the worldwide Freedom from Hunger campaign. Um, National Farmers Union was also one of the founding members of CARE right after World War II. Um, so the uh, idea or the, the, the dream uh, that hopefully we will, we will all realize of, of access for all, uh, for all people to healthy and, and good uh, uh, food uh, has been a part of National Farmers Union, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union's focus for a long, long time. The RMFU Co-op uh, Center's um, food justice focus is well stated in the seven cooperative business principles, which I'll just sort of go down. There are little bullets here for you. I wish I had a PowerPoint just for this one slide here. Um, they Co-ops, as I've mentioned, are owned by the people who use their products or services. They provide an economic benefit to members by returning surplus revenues proportionate to the member's use of the co-op. They are democratic organizations controlled by their members, not by outside investors. They are autonomous and independent. They recognize the need to educate about co-ops and support other co-ops. The co-op community in the US and in the world is a very, very tight community. Co-ops support other co-ops. The books are generally open. The records are there for folks to share as appropriate. Um, to, to help other co-ops get off the ground and, and, and be successful. Co-ops are motivated not primarily by profit. They are profit-making entities, but by serving the, but, but by service, excuse me, and by meeting members' needs. And co-ops are expected to demonstrate an abiding concern for their communities. Um, just briefly, examples of some of the projects we're working on, actually the co-op center, we have some 50 active projects right now, 25 or so of them are co-ops or budding co-ops. They have co-op potential. We do do work with other business models when appropriate. Um, we have submitted uh, grants uh, in the last six months for, for a um, uh, a producer cooperative in Durango, Colorado, a cooperative of family farmers and ranchers uh, looking for marketing and distribution support and food standards training. We have uh, helped, um, we have applied for a grant to help implement the High Plains Food Cooperatives 
Uh, next three to five year plan, it's an online food cooperative based in Western Kansas. Uh, that uh, has been able very successfully and growing very dramatically to bring its products uh, to the front range. Uh, it's a great way for farmers and ranchers in that area to find uh, very vibrant um, uh, markets. Uh, let's see, just a few other examples, um, and I'm looking at the watch, I promise, Deborah. Um, the, um, we have partnered with Real Food Colorado to sponsor three regional uh, Colorado produce growers safety plan workshops. Uh, we will follow this by producing a uh, food safety handbook series focused on specific food safety requirements in certain areas, something that's very needed uh, our members have been asking for. Uh, we are starting that with a, um, a booklet uh, on Weld County food safety pr uh, demands, requirements, and practices. Um, the, um, we are working very closely with the Vets to Farmers program uh, with the Sur Center for Rural Affairs in Nebraska. Uh, we, uh, this program hopefully will bring our returning veterans into the professional farming community. And we're very, very excited about this. Um, it's a program that has really found its, its uh, locale at this point in Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, we were asked by the Center for Rural Affairs to, uh, to, to market it in Colorado as well, and we're very excited about the prospects of this. Um, we are, um, one other that I will mention that I, I'm, I'm very excited about, last night I learned that the Ag Roundtable in Cortez, Colorado, um, is uh, very desirous of starting a um, local farmers cooperative, marketing cooperative, including a storefront in Cortez. And we have been asked to not only participate in the um, development of that cooperative, but also to help fund that cooperative, which the foundation will be very proud to do. We're extremely excited about that. Um, beginning farmers, we are very involved and have been funding uh, the land link program that uh, right now is centered in Chafee County, Colorado, but we hope to see it uh, become a statewide program. The um, land link is, uh, is bringing land that is, will be sold perhaps for development, who knows, but land owned by farmers whose families don't want to farm anymore for whatever reason can we possibly link those farmers, those sellers, with um, buyer, with new farmers who want to get into the, the, the profession? Uh, it's awfully difficult with the price of land these days to get into the profession, but can we in some way, you know, help that happen? So the land link programs are very, very exciting things. Um, we're also actually working uh, on a, a project uh, for uh, uh, small farmers to develop a cooperative in southern Arizona, of all things. So we're sort of branching out from those three states I mentioned. Um, we're very proud of our work uh, and very, uh, but I'm most proud of the people I work with, the, the, the consultants, uh, the one employee that we have in the Cooperative Development Center, they're the real stars and they do fabulous work. Uh, one is a farmer, 30-acre uh, um, organic uh, vegetable, uh, farm uh, just outside of Pueblo. Uh, the, uh, we have Cindy Torres working with us who is a Boulder resident who is the executive director of the uh, Colorado Farmers Market Association. So we have a n lots of very knowledgeable resources. As far as collaborative activity, um, that's really what we're all about. I'm going back again to Tanya's uh, outline. Uh, so collaborative activity, cooperation, they, they're perfect. <laughs> they're great synonyms. And uh, so we'd be delighted to collaborate in any appropriate way with your groups or organizations. Um, education, yes, we're very involved in education, as I mentioned before. And uh, though we are a membership organization, we always welcome folks who want to help in any way. That's addressing that idea of, voluntary, of volunteer opportunities. You know, in closing, I'd like to just say, just a paragraph, RMFU keeps a close eye on the, is keeping a close eye on the 2012 Farm Bill where at least 70% of the funding is under the nutrition title to provide, and, and part of that provides food to low-income uh, residents and uh, funds such worthy pro uh, projects as the school lunch and breakfast and after-school programs that we mentioned before. That's a great example for, of food justice for the producer, for more markets, um, more stability and security, 
uh, with respect to their business plans, as well as to the consumers I mentioned. Finally, Bob Waldrop, the founder of the Oklahoma Food Cooperative, the first online food cooperative in the, in the US, says that food is the great peacemaker because, all we, because we all need it and more and more of us, regardless of our politics or religion, want it to be locally grown and as fresh and natural as possible. Perhaps after all we've been through, it will be something as basic as good, healthy food that brings us all together. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was a great closing. And now we're going to hear from Jim Baldwin, who I really know nothing about at all, and he's from Community Food Share. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I did not bring any uh, material because I'm trying to save the environment. So um, if you want more information on Community Food Share, I encourage everyone to go to our website, which is communityfoodshare.org. And we have a lot of just an abundance of information there, as well as uh, wonderful up to date information on the Facebook site uh, that you can find the link to as well. I guess, first of all, I'd like to just uh, give a little bit of background about food banks. Um, whenever I'm speaking in public or making presentation, giving tours of community food share, um, I'm always surprised that a lot of folks don't even know where food banks came from or who we are or just how they evolved. And so um, community food share is part of a national organization called Feeding America. And Feeding America used to be known as Second Harvest, then America Second Harvest, and now they've changed their name to Feeding America. There are currently two, a little over 200 uh, Feeding America food banks in the country. They got their start back in the late 70s by a gentleman named John Van Hangel in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He um, had the experience of seeing a homeless individual doing dumpster diving. And seeing that it, it occurred to him that number one, that should never happen in our country. We shouldn't have individuals rooting through dumpsters to acquire food. The second thing that occurred to him is, well, why was that food in there in the first place? If he can consume it, how do we make sure that it doesn't go into the dumpster to begin with if it still can be used? And so John, at that time, created the, what, what, what was the first food bank in the country called St. Mary's Food Bank in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, with the primary objective of, first of all, trying to get food that would otherwise go into the dumpsters and landfill and, and try to distribute it as long as it was still wholesome and, and consumable, and then figure out a way to distribute it to individuals. Um, so he created the first food bank, and since the late 70s and the early 80s is when the big boom of food banks started coming up all, all over the country. Community Food Share was established in 1981, and so we're in our 32nd year uh, serving the community. So a lot has taken place over those last uh, 32 years as far as uh, collecting food and distributing it uh, has evolved into um, a large scale of uh, food collection and distribution. So that's really what Community Food Share's main goal is. We're the logistics, if you will, arm of uh, making sure food doesn't go to waste and how to get those to the individuals that can use it the most. So I mentioned that there is 200 food banks in the country. There are five Feeding America food banks in the state of Colorado. And the five of us established our own nonprofit called Feeding Colorado to kind of tie in with Feeding America. And so down in the south, there's Care and Share Food Bank in southern Colorado, serves 29 counties in southern Colorado. Um, there's the Food Bank of Rocky, uh, the Rockies in Denver that serves 31 counties across the center of the state. We serve Boulder and Broomfield County. Um, there's a food bank in Larimer that serves all of Larimer County and one in Weld. So between the five food banks in the state, we serve all 64 counties. And so on a monthly basis, we meet together and talk about logistics and who's got what and can you take this and I need more of that. And so we work real closely and we're making concerted efforts um, in the next year to look at um, all of the farmers, all of the produce, everything that's grown in Colorado. We try to respect each other's territory by not going into each other's counties and gathering food, 
but oftentimes that means that you know we're missing out on opportunities. So we want to collaborate closer and make sure that there's an agreement across the, the counties to say, hey, if, it's if it makes sense for me to go get it, go get it. <laughs> make sure it's not wasted and that uh, farmers and, and uh, growers are, are having an opportunity and outlet for their food. So that um, is the state kind of picture. Uh, locally, in uh, Boulder and Broomfield County, uh, Community Food Share works with about 50 other nonprofit organizations to distribute the food. Um, and I should probably back up a little bit. One of the things that we did um, seven, eight years ago was really trying to understand, we know where the food is now. Obviously, we've become very good at identifying sources of food and, and transportation and bringing it in. But we really didn't have a good handle on the need. What's the need in the community? So based on the most recent census data, there's uh, nearly 60,000 individuals in Boulder and Broomfield County that live at or below 130% of the poverty level. So that's a staggering figure. That's more to fill more people that would fill up Folsom Field, um, 60,000 individuals in our community. And we, we targeted 130% um, of poverty as being kind of the most at-risk um, individuals that would need food assistance. So with 60,000 people needing additional food assistance, to put it into more understandable terms, for a family of four, that would be an annual income of about $29,000. So there's a lot of folks out there that are working, that have income, they just don't have enough resources to meet all of their food needs. So that is really our target market. 130% of poverty, 60,000 people, they're the ones that need help putting food on the table. So Community Food Share then goes out into the community, finds the food, the main sources of food, and it's, again, it wouldn't be any big surprise, is the food industry, supermarkets, manufacturers, and everything else. So while the, the types of food that we gather may not always be the best, most nutritious food, we want to make sure that it's not going to waste. It's better to at least collect it and provide it to somebody rather than put it in the landfill. So our main sources of food, obviously, through, America's, through, through Feeding America are the food manufacturers. They solicit large donations from the main large food manufacturers, uh, General Bills, Tabisco, Kellogg's, all of those large companies. Those companies will donate hundreds of semi-loads of product, and Feeding America gets it spread out throughout the country to one of their 200 food banks. So that's kind of the national level of where the food comes from. Locally, we're, we have um, trucks on the road every single day of the week picking up product from uh, King Supers, Whole Foods, Safeways, uh, Super Walmarts, Targets, Sunflower Market, every food retailer in the county. Um, we're out there visiting and picking up their, their uh, close-dated products. And these are typically products that are either you know, approaching their pull-by dates, um, they're getting new inventory in. We're helping them clear out their inventory for uh, new, fresh inventory coming in. So we're, we're providing a business service as well to these retailers by ma helping them manage their inventory and move it. So that's kind of the local um, retail setting. We also get um, large donations from our uh, local manufacturers. We don't have a lot of local food manufacturers, but the big one that everybody's familiar with, of course, is White Wave Foods, formerly Horizon Organic Dairy. And so they have been extremely generous in donating thousands of gallons of fresh milk right out of their plant to Community Food Share to distribute every week. And so those are the sources, those are the main sources, not to mention the farmers in the area, uh, Munson Farms, um, Full Circle Farms. I mean, the list is longer than I can name, but many of those farmers, um, they either have produced more than can be sold in the marketplace, or they don't meet the retailer's uh, specifications, and so they're more than willing to donate to Community Food Share, and this is great, great product. So we have those sources of foods, and then of course, many of you have uh, seen and are familiar uh, with uh, community food drives that go on. We have two main food drives in the community, one at the Times Call, one at the Daily Camera, and again, that means that is not a huge source of food as far as the volume that we distribute, but what it is, is it's the variety of food that the community uh, donates through that effort. And it's an awareness thing, to bring awareness to the community that there are those in our community less fortunate that can't put enough food on their table. 
So those, those represent the main um, sources of where we get our food. The uh, channels, if you will, how do we distribute the food then, is uh, through, like I mentioned earlier, um, a network of about 50 nonprofit agencies. Um, about 70% of our volume um, goes through one of those 50 agencies. In this year, we're gonna bring in about 8 million pounds of food in, uh, uh, in our current fiscal year, which ends June 30th. So the agencies, uh, nonprofit agencies, those are faith groups, other nonprofit agencies like Sister Carmen, the Our Center, EFA, uh, those, the Homeless Shelter, St. Vrain Safe Shelter, those are the types of agencies that receive food from us. We have 50 of those. So like I mentioned, about 70% of our food flows through one of those agencies. One of the in interesting things when we were part, as part of Feeding America, um, for, the, for our first 25 years, we were like all the other food banks in the country, and Feeding America allows their food banks to charge a handling fee to nonprofits that they provide food to. Well, in 2007, we made a radical decision <laughs> to not charge anymore. Um, we came to the conclusion that uh, Feeding America, through their, um, their ability to allow us to charge, which was only like 18 cents a pound is the most we could charge, what we found is that it was a real barrier to a lot of our agencies, that they had to go out and raise that money and then uh, just basically give it to us. And we were, it wasn't really considered selling food, but we were you know, recouping a handling fee. For many of our larger agencies, that was fifteen or $20,000 a year is what they were you know, using. And we just came to the conclusion in 2007 to eliminate all fees related to the food, that our goal was to collect as much food as we could get and get it back into the community and to those agencies' hands that could use it. So in 2007, when we did that, that resulted in like $140,000 to our revenue uh, that we had to figure out where else to get the money from. Well, fortunately, our community was extremely generous, and that first year that we did it, we were able to raise the additional $140,000 through a lot of different sources, and that meant $140,000 back in those agencies' hands to either put towards their programs or whatever else they could use it for. Now, in 2012, with our volume increase of 8 million pounds, um, that, that would equate to about $280,000 that, you know, is back into the community in the hands of the agencies. We just felt like it was the really the right thing to do. So that we're one of the few, there's only like about 15 food banks out of the 200 that don't charge any uh, handling fees uh, related to the food. So we don't charge anything for delivery as well. Some of the larger agencies that uh, get food from us, we will have volunteers come in, pull the orders based on uh, what the agencies order from us. We have volunteers pick it, palletize it, and put it on our trucks, and we deliver it to the agencies, all at no charge. We just feel like that's our role in the community. That's the role we play is the logistics issue of getting that food and distributing it back out and being used. Um, so I've talked about the need, 30,000 people, I mean 60,000 people, 130% of poverty. Talked about a little bit about the source of where it comes from. Talked a little bit about the distribution mechanism, mentioned the agencies. We also created, in 2008, we created a direct service program, realizing that the 50 agencies that are in the community, there was um, a not uh, a lot additional capacity available. So in order to um, meet the need of those individuals, we created a direct service program called Feeding Families. We did this through some pilot programs at some schools, and then we brought it to our facility, and our target for that program is to make food available to families that have a child on the free lunch program in either the Boulder Valley or St. Vrain School District. That combined population is 13,000 kids that are on free lunch alone. That's not even the reduced lunch. So free lunch alone between the two school districts are 13,000 kids. What we wanted to do was to make a, a distribution system where we could get them in the doors, get their ne food needs met, and um, we created that. So currently, we have about 1,200 families enrolled in the program. We're seeing about 650 to 700 families a week coming directly to our warehouse to get uh, food assistance. And um, 
we have a goal to meet that food need for those families, but at the same time work with our 50 agencies and get those folks back connected with their, as capacity issues arise and agencies can take those families in, we have a desire to kind of refer and get them back connected. But the first thing was to make sure that their food needs were met. So we started that program, it's been a growing program. Uh, the school districts have been great to work with. The only requirement is that the family has to just bring their letter from the school district saying that their ch child qualifies for free lunch. And so we don't want to, we didn't want to get into the screening process at that point. So we're, we're meeting that need. So those are the, um, the ways that the food is getting distributed through the agencies. 75% go out to the nonprofit agencies. The remaining 30% goes out to that Feeding Families program. And then a smaller percentage goes out to another program we have, which is called Elder Share, which is directly targeted to a senior population. So that kind of gives you an overview of who we are, what we do, and everything else. One of the new initiatives that we're working on, and I should tell you a little bit about the mix of food, is um, food, Community Food Share was one of the first food banks in the country about 10 years ago to really start to nutritionally index the types of food. When I started in 2012, I would have people ask me, so how much, you know, dairy are you doing? How much uh, vegetables, fruit? I, said, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it just, we didn't have a way to do it. So we started um, uh, uh, indexing the food when it came in and making it available. I mean, uh, identifying it which food, food, guy, food category it was in. So fast forward to 2012, we are working with a group um, that invited us to participate in a pilot program. It's made of, of uh, Mazon, which is the Jewish response to hunger, uh, UC Berkeley, and Kaiser Permanente invited us to some discussions about improving the nutritional mix within food banks across the country. So in June, in July of this year, we're going to be launching a new uh, inventory software and uh, a nutritional indexing system called CHOP. It stands for Choose Healthy Options and it was established by the food bank in uh, Philadelphia. And basically what it does is it, it looks at the nutritional contents of all foods and assigns a value to it and then color codes it. And you may have seen some of these kinds of things in your supermarkets. It's either you know, uh, green, yellow, or red. And so we're gonna uh, be adopting that so that we can better serve agencies and help them identify what are the more nutritional items as well as families that are coming in to, to pick up food. So again, I just wanna, um, wanted to give that overview of community food share, how we work together, the collaboration we have with the counties, the cities, the agencies, the other food banks, Feeding America, the whole nine yards. Um, and then the other thing is just the volume of volunteers that we have. 2,500 volunteers in, a, in a each year come and help us do all the things that we need to do to make this system happen. So thank you for this opportunity and again for more information um, you can go to our uh, website at communityfoodshare.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. I had no idea that, that, that the food share thing was so far reaching. It's really fantastic. Next, we're going to hear from Jennifer Eads, right? Is this, she's the Self-Sufficiency and Community Support Division Director for Boulder County Housing and Human Services. She oversees programs and services that help stabilize families and individuals through housing supports, medical coverage and access, food assistance, utility assistance, child care, child support, and early intervention and prevention programs. The division affirms that all families and individuals have the right to easy access to health care, food, and economic security that lead to self-sufficiency. Currently, the division provides medical benefits to over 32,000 Boulder County residents and food assistance to almost 17,000 residents. Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm. Uh equally pleased to be here and um, have learned a lot so far. Um, and I want to really start off by saying how um, fortunate I feel to work in a community that values um, these basic human rights and really works to um, create a safety net and collaborative partnerships that um, really help our most vulnerable citizens. And I'm really proud of the work that we do um, as an organization and with our community partner. So um, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the division, the department as a whole. So 
Boulder County Housing and Human Services, um, the mission is to support and sustain healthy communities um, that strengthen families and individuals while promoting human dignity and hope for the future. The department overall provides housing supports and developments that, can meet, that meet the community needs, um, such as Josephine Commons Senior Housing, uh, affordable housing project in Lafayette. Um, we also support the uh, Boulder uh, countywide um, Section 8 program. Um, we have a housing continuum for uh, families in housing crisis. Um, we also provide all of the child and adult protection services and family and children services that really create family uh, stability. And then we have all the self-sufficiency programs um, that were just mentioned that are in my division. And really the overall goal of our entire department um, over the last uh, few years is to really figure out how to provide the right level of service at the right time to support individual and family stability and to pr provide these services in an early intervention and prevention framework um, at the whenever that's an opportunity. Um, and this really means that access to food stability, medical coverage and care, housing stability, and financial assistance are core to that piece. Um, I'm sure all of you know th there's not a lot of families or individuals that can move towards any type of self-sufficiency if they're struggling with hunger or housing issues. It's just it's really an impossible um, uphill battle. So really trying to find the right amount of resources at the right time that really take those um, safety net considerations, um, stabilize the family, and then allow us and our community partners to work on the long-term goals towards self-sufficiency. Um, some of the other um, pieces that we do in my division, um, we do a lot of outreach and enrollment. And during the recession, we have uh, really made a concerted effort to um, get out into the community and find folks who are, are eligible but don't know that they're eligible. So in 2008, we had about 6,670 people on food assistance. Now that number is around uh, 17,000, um, 17,000, roughly 17,000 folks. So that's an increase of 150%. At the same time, we had about um, 19,000 folks on Medicaid in 2008. And during the recession, we're now up to almost 33,000. So one in nine and a half, one in 10 Boulder County residents is on a, a public assistance benefit at this time. And e even though there was a workload increase and it was kind of this un unprecedented demand, we, we tried to do two things simultaneously. Put the issue of um, benefits on the radar screen of folks and really say, we've got to stabilize, we've got to find these families, we have to find these individuals, we have to find these kids and get them on these core benefits so that they can stabilize. And um, simultaneously, really redesign our business processes to be able to handle that much of an increase. Um, throughout the recession and, and, and then tie them to, when, you know, once we have an entry point, um, we have an any door is the right door philosophy. So if you come in for childcare, we're gonna ask you if you have, have food security issues. And if you meet the requirements for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, or food assistance, we're going to enroll you, um, even though that's not what you came in for. And, and vice versa, if you're coming in for um, food assistance, we're gonna ask about family medical coverage and um, childcare and all of those other access points. Um, we've really benefited from this philosophy um, in that we're, we're able to stabilize families and individuals in these basic needs. Are, at the same time, these caseload increases were happening. Our child welfare out-of-home placements were reduced by 60%. So you have an ability of a community to react well together to this economic downturn, stabilize families, and take out the poverty drivers that lead to child abuse and neglect, and stabilize families in their community with the help of the community. And so it's been this really transformational uh, time for us. Um, and a lot of people um, in our department and in our community and in this room have been very key in that. Um, one of the um, things I really wanted to stress today is how um, deeply involved um, our staff and our organization are um, to, to the statement that we believe all, all people should have access to um, the benefits uh, and um, uh, services that help them uh, stabilize. And a couple other things I wanted to talk about. Um, 
is just the, the commitment of staff to change their workflow and to be responsive to uh, the number of people coming in. During this time of increased caseloads, we've also become one of the best in the state at processing timely. Um, so last week I pulled some t statistics and 96% of our applications were processed timely and the state average is 89%. Um, and so despite the sort of amount of work that's coming in, um, we're able to really uh, create that uh, through really commitment to, to um, folks having access to this. Um, some other key uh, ways that we're really trying to reach our community is to destigmatize public benefits. Um, you'll see some brochures um, on our website and at the front table. We talk about food assistance as grocery assistance or food assistance, not as food stamps. And we talk about medical coverage as access to medical coverage and care and not Medicaid. Um, because what we're finding during the recession is that many of our, the, most of the folks that are now on benefits that weren't in 2008, they're, they're new to needing government assistance. And we really have to talk about it in a, in a way um, that has dignity that really destigmatizes um, the whole process and is very warm and welcoming. Um, because folks do deserve this, and it's not necessarily um, usually talked about in those terms, whether that's in the media or um, in, in government agencies. So really trying to make that a warm and welcoming um, environment. Um, in addition to our core responsibility of eligibility and enrollment, we, we work with an integrated approach to make sure that um, all the folks that are coming into our doors are also linked to the SNAP education programs that uh, Bill had mentioned, as well as WIC um, and local food banks and our emergency service providers who can also assess whether they might, the family or the individual might need other soft touch services. Maybe it's um, some uh, clothing assistance or maybe it might be a little bit of rental assistance. Um, but really trying to link families and individuals to the services out in the community in addition to our core services. Um, and, and we, we try to foster this, uh, all of this collaborative activity. Um, I know there's some folks in the room who helped us distribute a upwards of 40,000 uh, door hangers um, in low-income neighborhoods that talked about our programs and services and uh, Joan's in the room and has been working with our staff for four years um, to really help us reach uh, target populations that would benefit. Um, and we really believe that this, the human services continuum, because it's so broad and so deep, has to be a collaborative effort. It has to be community-based. It has to be locally relevant. And that there's many, many important organizations that are aligned to provide this assistance. Um, and I also believe that creating this easy access um, for folks is everyone's responsibility. Um, wherever we can cut out uh, bureaucratic paperwork or um, make it easier for folks to get what they need, I think we should be looking at that. Um, I think our work locally is impressive across the spectrum. Um, I know uh, Jim had mentioned some of the other safety net service providers that are providing uh, food assistance and um, other assistance and, and Community Food Share is a key partner in this um, when, we're, when we're especially talking about the low income um, populations. And I was trying to do some numbers, you know, even as well as we are doing, we know that there are folks that don't know about our services and don't know that they um, they uh, would be eligible for this. And so we've done some pretty um, aggressive strategies around that. I talked a little bit about the destigmatizing of benefits and the door hangers, but we have also co-located our staff at key community access points. So we are in both school districts now with folks who can enroll um, kids and families in Medicaid, food assistance, cash assistance. We are also at Sister Karma, K Carmen, EFA, and our center. We work closely with the community food share to put um, technicians there to help enroll. Um, and we are also at both clinic and at Salud. And so really trying to penetrate out into the community. And there's definitely one uh, strategy we're trying to take on fairly aggressively. Um, we have two staff dedicated to uh, senior outreach for food assistance because it's a very hard to reach population. And there's been a lot of recent rule changes um, that have allowed more seniors to become eligible. Um, but again, there's a, there's a government stigma piece and there's also sort of history that the government hasn't done a great job in making it easy. So a few years ago, there was a 27 page application to do food assistance. We now have a two page senior application and we also have the ability to enroll folks online through the Colorado Peak 
online application. So we are really trying to find out how can we help folks, even if it's $30 a month, that's still a significant amount that can help buy fresh groceries and, and some pieces like that. Um, we're always looking to collaborate. Uh, we're always looking for um, more creative ideas to ha uh, around how to get our services out into the community and how to partner um, so folks feel like we're, we're a good entry point, um, that they have a great experience with us. Um, and in closing, um, I would inv I first would like to, uh, again, thank everyone here and also say if you are interested in volunteering, we our volunteer services coordinator, Ann Sullivan, is actually here today um, and has been very active in all of uh, our work. And um, I can get that contact information um, to you. Um, but as this is going to be on the radio, I wanted my staff to hear and the, the community to hear how deeply, deeply grateful we are that this community cares about this issue, that this community passed the temporary safety net tax that has brought more money into the community to really help um, invest in food assistance, housing assistance, emergency services. And I have deep gratitude to uh, the eligibility technicians in my staff. It's a, there are about now 90 of them who have been working overtime for two years um, to make sure that folks have these services and I, I am just deeply grateful for their commitment and um, the organization, the commissioners and the, and the community. So um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Jennifer. That's a huge job. Wow. And as I'm fond of saying, last but not least, my new friend, Lynette Marie Hanthorn, is co-founder and executive director of Transition Colorado, a Boulder-based nonprofit organization that embraces the ethics and principles of the global transition movement to localize and regenerate community. Lynette Marie was founder and executive director of a nonprofit criminal justice and mediation organization for more than 20 years, with a background in restorative justice, permaculture design, holacracy, I hope she tells us what that is, and deep transition, Lynette Marie applies a whole systems approach to the process of relocalization. Lynette? Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here today to share with you a piece of what's going on at Transition Colorado. What I'm going to do is give you uh, just a quick overview of Transition Colorado, but also delve into the process or the thinking of what's going on with us at Transition Colorado so that you have a, a feel for who we are. And I'd like to just bring up some key thoughts that have stimulated the direction of our organization. With me today, I wanted to just introduce Michael Brownlee, who's also co-founder of Transition Colorado, and Beth Miller, who's our supporter and uh, assistant at the organization. We're a small outfit. Um, and we have big eyes. We began our organization in 2005 as Boulder Valley Relocalization with the focus on relocalization. And that's about communities meeting their own essential needs locally by building community resilience and self-reliance in food, energy, and economy. We acquired our 501c3 nonprofit status in 2008 and became the first transition initiative in North America. We were functioning as a hub and we continue to do that and we help other transition initiatives to develop. And the focus of much of our work has now evolved into the area of food, local food rebuilding the local food system and the local food economy through our work here in Boulder County. And we share that with other budding transition initiatives. 
were aligned with the global transition movement, which had its early beginnings in Kinsale, Ireland, and the movement exploded into a global movement, doing very much of what uh, Deborah had mentioned in terms of taking on the ethics and principles of permaculture. And the ethics themselves really capture what permaculture is about, which is care for the earth, care for people, share the surplus. The neat thing about permaculture, which is permanent culture, is it, it, it emphasizes our being with nature, our relating to nature and seeing the patterns of nature and how that relationship can be mutually supportive and self-generative. So permaculture provides us in transition a lens in which to look through, to see and experience the relatedness of all life and our place within the web of existence. This lens is very different from the world that many people experience, where there is a disconnection with one another and no sense of place. Last year, uh, we had the opportunity to spend some time with Gary Nabhan. Uh, Gary's known as the father of the local food movement. He's also, his latest book is Chasing Chilies. And Gary shared his concern that we happen to be living with, without the experience of sacredness. And he reminded us, those of us at Transition Colorado, that food is sacred and that every day we receive a daily sacrament. That really had an impact on all of us because the question that we started to hold was how do we assure that every human being in Boulder County has the opportunity to receive their daily sacrament? Well, early on in our organization, we had a local food working group that estimated how much food that we could produce for the residents here in Boulder County. And what we discovered was that there was, there's enough that could be produced was right around uh, 20,000 people that could actually be fed in the county, especially if there was some kind of uh, emergency or um, experience that we had that was uh, making it difficult for us to live the lives that we're currently living. Well, when you consider that there are 300,000 residents here in Boulder County, feeding 20,000 just doesn't cut it. Well, we did some reformulation thinking about how about growing food wherever we could, we could grow it. And what we came up with was that we could increase the amount of folks that we could feed up to 185,000. Still, that was not enough. What we discovered was that we actually felt vulnerable in the case of some kind of unexpected experience. And it brought home to us a very specific understanding, actually two things. First of all, that we're all food insecure, considering the transformative world that we're living in. And secondly, what have we done or what are we doing that is creating this situation? What is our participation in that? We had to look at that very seriously. Well. We had a vision. Recognizing the need to increase support for our local food shed, knowing where our food comes from, our organization launched the Boulder County Eat Local campaign in, in 2007. And this was a, an ongoing awareness campaign that took on many levels. We had all kinds of events, film screenings, uh, workshops, classes, we even put out our first publication for a directory on local food. We involve businesses, farmers, organizations, and local government in discussions about the uh, resilience of our food shed. We were looking at what kinds of strategic relationships did we need to forge to really get some key elements done here in Boulder County. 
but we also needed to know who saw what we saw. So in 2008, we hosted the Boulder County Food Summit with a local group, Everybody Eats, bringing farmers and citizens together with key decision makers and policy makers to discuss local food issues and coalescing, if possible, coalescing a group of folks who'd be willing to support the vision of a local food economy. Well, in the fall of 2008, we got a sign. It's really important to get signs to know what you're doing. And this is what happened. 40,000 people showed up on the Miller Farm in Northeast Colorado to do gleaning for the weekend. Some people did the gleaning, but most people got turned away. What it revealed to us is that people are hungry and there's not enough. It was a sign that said we were on the right track. And that was probably the most single action that really brought us to a very important piece in our understanding in the way that we work and that the world works. And that is that it's really important to encourage everyone to trust what you know. Because the movement of the world is constantly pulling us in other directions. Well, so we got to know that, but we also realized that we were part of the local food movement. And that was significant because there were certain results that also clued us in during that year of 2008. And that is that what happened since our beginning and our involvement with the local food movement, we discovered that community supported agriculture shares or CSAs um, substantially increased during that period of time, actually exponentially that the number of restaurants serving uh, food that was locally sourced increased by tenfold, and that Colorado became a hotbed for permaculture activity and education. That's according to Peter Bain, who's the publisher of The Permaculture Activist. What we, what we discovered we also had to collect more information um, it's amazing how this, we do live in an information era and we're just bombarded. And sometimes you miss things, but we had to get really close to home to find out what is going on here. And one of the things that we looked at is that the Boulder Farmers Market or the Boulder Farmers Markets has around 18,000 people that show up on a Saturday. That's a lot of people. But we also looked at, at the farmer's market, the entire season sale would only feed people for a day and a half. We were also aware that many of the market farmers qualify for food stamps. And many of them have full-time jobs just to enable them to do the farming. These are the kinds of things that compelled us to move in the direction of focusing on local food, to rebuilding our local food system and our local food economy. Well, in any organization or any direction that you're going with your organization, you always have to do a little tweaking. And we found that in 2010, our organization needed to begin a 10% local food shift pledge. This became really important because we wanted to increase the demand for locally sourced food and increase production capacity and ultimately to rebuild the infrastructure of the local food shed. But what would that mean if we're doing that? Well, we have to look at what's currently going on in Boulder County. And when you take a look at what we consume, and that is uh, the food that we consume that's locally produced, $900 million is spent on food 
that we consume in a year, but only 2% of that is produced in Boulder County. And then when you take a look at the agricultural land that's available in Boulder County, there's 137,000 acres of farmland and ranch land, and less than 2% of our total food production in the county is going to feed people who actually live here. That means that we're exporting everything else. That's significant information. Well, this year, we're rebranding re the entire Eat Local campaign as the local food shift. And our key project is the 10% local food shift pledge. And here, what we're having people do is to sign up online at localfoodshift.com record their total purchases, uh, take a guess at what they're spending locally, or if you're really uh, wanting to be specific, you can add it up and be very clear exactly how much you're spending on food that's produced locally, local purchases. And then we have an online tracking. What we want to do is to see if people would sign up for the pledge, a thousand people in the ne this next year and raise a million dollars for the local food economy. That will make a big difference. Our support for the 10% pledge um, is provided by some very interesting folks. The Boulder County Farmers Market, Lucky's Market in North Boulder, and Whole Foods Market. We have a larger vision, however, and that is we want to go from 10% to a 25% shift. But that would mean a fundamental change in our local food system. And that's a whole nother conversation. The main benefit of the 10% pledge is that, at least as far as what we're seeing, is that people are beginning to reach out to one another. There's this relational aspect of the 10% pledge that brings people together because they start talking to one another. And people start being really proud of the place where they live. It's not only the organizations that have a pride in being here. It's people start having pride in living in Boulder County. And what does that look like in terms of action? What are we seeing in our organization? Well, people are signing up continuing to sign up for permaculture courses. Anywhere from an eight-month intensive, intensive to a, a two-week intensive. And people are having visions of the land that they've either inherited or that they've inquire, um, acquired. And what they're doing is they want to create food forests, demonstration farms. They want to reach out and engage with the public in a meaningful way. Uh, people are creating buying clubs where they can reduce the cost of bulk food purchases. See You Going Local developed the Second Kitchen on campus, which is a buying club, a cooperative. Um, people are continuing to map accessible fruit trees for foraging, which is essentially free food. And people are coming forward with significant entrepreneurial proposals for business that include growing food, creating jobs, sharing the surplus. And we recognize that we live in a network. We live in a web of life. And we know that food is a connector to so many things, from the improvement of health to um, reducing your own energy foot footprint to discovering needs and opportunities within, within the community. There's so much that we can learn just with food. Okay, so in, so in my closing, in terms if you want to be a volunteer at Transition Colorado, the most important thing that you can do is sign up for the 10% pledge. 
participate, watch those numbers be tracked, and move that money to support our market farmers, the production of healthy, delicious food here in Boulder County. Thank you. Thank you so much. 10% doesn't seem like very much, does it? Mm -hmm. It's a lot bigger than two, though. Um, we're going to open up for questions. Remember, you need to come to the mic. But I have one question for you all before you come to the mic, and that is, which 10% of our food is not local? Did you figure it out? I'll give you a hint. It's orange. These aren't in yet in Colorado. <laughs> Do we have questions for any of our panelists or general questions? Please come to the mic. I'm Joan Nagel. I'm on the Social Action Committee at Congregation Boney Shalom, and also I do community outreach for um, Boulder County Healthy Kids. I had a quick question. When you are looking at that 10%, how big an area do you consider local? <laughs> Anything less than global. That's one definition. Um, of course, you've heard about the 100-mile diet, so a lot of people consider the 100-mile 100, 100 radius. I think the USDA says 400 miles radius. Okay, so I'd like to thank Colorado. And also, I just wanted to mention that um, the, there's a lot of material on the table, and I know Jennifer brought some, uh, some of those um, door hangers, and the income guidelines, at least for the uh, medical insurance for kids, it's, and for families has increased, the income guidelines have increased, and so there are other um, flyers for uh, Boulder County Healthy Kids and also for the Child Care Assistance Program because those um, income guidelines have increased a little and housing counseling. Thank you. Um, I have real concern about the cuts in food stamps that's happened because I know some people that are on it and it's put incredible stress on families. How are we making up for that? Because, uh, you know, family, uh, a single mom with two teenage kids got $400 something a month and it was cut by 112. So it's making tremendous pressure on this parent to feed her children. For instance, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's always concerning when families are, are kind of coming up on the cliff effect. So, um, a couple of one thing that happened this year that was um, r really hard for me to understand, and a lot of policymakers in in the state um, it, it, is that the federal guidelines changed the energy. Um, and utility allowance. So they set a standard utility allowance that is an automatic deduction um, that creates, uh, so it takes the expense into consideration. And they, the federal government basically said that the utility expense went down. So I, I don't know if anybody in the room had their utilities go down, but <laughs> so that really resulted in about 66% of our uh, local population getting around a $20 a month cut just because of that, and that, that was catastrophic. And then I think the, the other challenge is when a family starts to make a little bit more money, it's the federal regulations that cut back on the, the, the food assistance, and you see that in all of the benefit programs, um, and they're not locally controllable. We do a lot in our community and um, as leaders in our county, meeting with the state and the federal policymakers, and we um, put it on our legislative agenda as often as possible to really look at 
what does it really cost to live um, and to provide for your family? And can we move the needle on some of these benefits? Because clearly they need to be higher or people wouldn't be hungry and people wouldn't be out of medical access or wouldn't be able to afford childcare. So we're trying to push that at a federal level. At a local level, the best we can do is try to figure out ways to supplement the food assistance. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, it, the community food share and the local partners and the faith-based organizations and the food banks and the free access to food really needs to come into um, play in this. And uh, there's a great documentary I saw the, uh, last year at the Rocky Mountain Women's International Film Festival called Food Stamped. And it, it's a, she's a nutritionist who, um, for uh, two weeks, she and her she tried to live on a on a food stamp budget for a family of two um, nutritionally, and it just documents the challenges. And you know, you see her going into Whole Foods and like stealing the free cheese samples um, because she couldn't afford cheese. And and I think that you know, it's just really important to understand how difficult it is to live on a food assistance budget, and do that nutritionally and then as a community try to figure out ways that we can supplement that again with dignity and easy access okay so has the access i mean i know there were sometimes limitations on families going in they could only have so many points worth of food at the food banks has that mm -hmm. increased to make up for this decrease in, in uh, yeah i think that um i know that the local safety net providers have really taken into consideration um, the types of food and the amount of food that families need. And uh, Jim, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit as well. I don't know the specifics. Okay. Okay. Because I know that what's happening is that I'm driving this mother to Walmart because she can get cheaper food. I know it's less nutritionally right. good, but that's the way she can keep her two teenage sons from being hungry. That, so. that's a, that's a, it actually is in food stamped as well. You, the, these big mega stores also know when the food assistance allocation hits the, the debit cards, the EBT cards, and they stock their shelves according to that schedule with filler foods, cheap bulk purchases, and a lot of it is nutritionally void. Right. And it's a really compelling, um, compelling documentary I'd recommend. Yes, uh, I hope that locally people who are involved in providing food safety nets take this into consideration when they look at the limitations of yeah. people accessing that food. What I can say is that the big safety net providers and community food share have been working to get more milk, meat, produce, making those really nutritionally um, sound choices available. Um, as a as a as a real concerted effort, so that is becoming more available, and I think that has been um, it's been a a push that's very recent. Um, yeah. Thank you. First of all, let me thank you all for the hard work you're doing because I knew you're making a difference. Um, thought it was appropriate that I share a photo that my cousin posted on Facebook this morning. It was a gravestone that said, Monsanto, we ate our own food. Um, actually, my question has to do with how can we help you identify the people that can benefit from the services that you're offering if we don't have the information about what those income levels and what those lifestyles look like? Is there a way that the general population, because I know we got a lot of educated people, especially in Boulder County, who would be happy to say to their neighbor, hey, I found out about something that could help you. Um, so what would be the best possible way that we could get that information so that we could help you identify? I appreciate that offer, and it does take a community and those those interpersonal connections um, to really talk to people who didn't ever think that they would be eligible for these services and what we've tried to do and you'll see a few of them in the in the front and I can um, provide more and there we're actually with Joan thank you for pointing out the income guidelines um, we are working there at the printers now the posters so we've raised some eligibility okay. requirements where possible but we've tried to make it very simple um, because it is government speak you have all these federal regu regulations we've taken that off of our posters and we're saying if you need grocery assistance and you make um, 
if your monthly gross income is eleven $1 hundred and eighty dollars and you're a single person you you're going to be a, you're most likely going to qualify so okay. we've tried to really make it as basic as possible and then we um in boulder county we are um, the home of the statewide training um, project for the colorado peak online benefit application and what that is, there's a screening tool there that's very user friendly and it's in english and spanish and you can sit with a family um, or send them to the site. It's very user friendly to ask them to screen themselves for what they might be eligible for. And that'll tell them you're most likely eligible for food assistance, you're most likely eligible for Medicaid. And if they want to apply, then they can go on to the application piece and begin the application, or they know they're eligible and they can come into one of our offices. And our team in Boulder County has been training um, everyone statewide because of our collaborative approach. We were asked, could you train community partners in how to be application assistance sites? And so we've trained 3,000 people uh, statewide to do this work, and we have a lot of posters um, and information that, uh, at the front as well, and we can do a training for any congregation. We can do a training for any um, group of folks, uh, organizations interested. Great, okay. Also, our church has a garden, and um, we know that there are congregations that are involved in these community garden things, but we don't know how to connect with that, so I need to introduce you to somebody over here later, okay? Um, but thank you again. Thanks. Can I just offer a service? I'm sorry, I didn't go to the mic, but we put out a newsletter every month, and it goes to hundreds of congregations. If you want to give information about contact or things like that for these services, we're happy to put it in our newsletter. That would be great. I would love to. Thank you. there is an opportunity I had a question for Bill um, I'm wondering if you have a presence in Boulder County oh yes we do uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union actually has in Colorado I believe it's 22 chapters and we have a Boulder County chapter be delighted to share information with you on that absolutely. that would be another opportunity for the website so yes. I'd appreciate that yeah, absolutely Where I'd be and honest. I also recommend um, if any of you here want to share information at Boulder County Senior Law Day? That will be taking place on August the 11th in Longmont, and I have some flyers out on the table as well. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you all so much for coming, especially our panelists, this was um, rich, to say the least. And I noticed none of you have eaten your chocolate, so I would encourage you to take it. <laughs> I also want to thank Har Hashem again for hosting us and uh, Boulder County Housing for co-sponsoring. And remind you once again to please um, Fill out your evaluations. You can just leave them on the table, or you can give them to Megan, who's going to wave to you down there at the end. <laughs> uh, our next forum, which happens here June 28th, is uh, on this, this sheet that you have. It's entitled Falling Through the Cracks, Identifying the Cultural Dynamics Impacting Youth. And I, I have one more. Um, one more thank you that often doesn't happen because Tanya is usually at the mic and I would like to thank Tanya for making this all happen year after year after year. Thank you all.